Uh, again, my name is Ted Clement, Executive Director of Save Mount Diablo, and I just want to welcome you all to Save Mount Diablo's Nature Heals and Inspires Zoom series. For those who might be new to Save Mount Diablo, we're a nationally accredited nonprofit land trust formed in 1971 in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have a mission to protect the important open space lands associated with Mount Diablo and the mountain's connection to its sustaining Diablo range. To create lasting public benefits such as parks and trails, we use various tools like land acquisition, advocacy, education, and stewardship. Understanding that nature is the ultimate foundation for our long-term health and well-being, we developed a free public education Zoom series entitled Nature Heals and Inspires to help our communities understand that nature is a critical part of the solution to working through these challenging times. Beyond the documented health and psychological benefits of being in nature, going outside to connect with nature will also help address arguably the most serious environmental problem facing our planet, the lack of meaningful connections between people and nature in this era of nature deficit disorder, which results in us lacking the love and will required to fully address major environmental threats like the climate crisis. Thankfully, nature is a spiritual portal where if we quietly and respectfully enter it with open hearts and minds, we will be transformed for the better. And in that lies our hope and for salvation and survival. Our Nature Heals and Inspires Zoom series started in April, 2020. And to date, we have delivered over 20 presentations by an amazing and diverse group of experts, ecotherapists, conservationists, scholars, artists, etc all exploring this topic of how nature helps heal and inspire us. And through this exploration, we have been getting important clues on how to align ourselves and our culture with the natural world that we're a part of. Thankfully, because of you, our wonderful supporters, uh, we continue to uplift our communities with our usual nonprofit land conservation work for the Mount Diablo area, along with additional efforts like our Nature Heals and Inspires Zoom series. Today, we have a special gift of gratitude and inspiration for you, our supporters. Sean Burke's Nature Heals and Inspires presentation entitled, Preserving the Past, Inspiring the Future, History of Mount Diablo in the Interconnectivity of Local People and the Natural World. Sean will lead us in a pre-recorded presentation about the history of Native Americans in the Mount Diablo area in the interconnectivity of local people and the natural world something that may help us understand how to live in better harmony with the natural world that we are a part of and depend upon for our survival. After the pre-recorded presentation, Sean will then come on live to answer questions you may have. Before joining Save Mount Diablo's staff team as our land programs director, Sean worked as a park ranger for East Bay Regional Park District, preserving and stewarding the land and waters on and around Mount Diablo in introducing the public to the area's ecological and cultural significance. Sean is a member of the Cherokee Nation. He works and collaborates with various native peoples of the Mount Diablo area, and he has worked on a number of volunteer restoration projects with the Bay Area Climbers Coalition, with the Peregrine Team in Pine Canyon, and in Yosemite National Park with the American Alpine Club and Sacred Rock. Sean and his wife, Frenchie, are also accomplished alpinists, and we're really grateful to have Sean on our uh, Save Mount Diablo team. Together with your wonderful support, which we are most thankful for, Save Mount Diablo will continue to do great things to protect the ultimate foundation for our long-term health and well-being, nature. But let nature continue to heal and inspire. Sean, thanks for doing this presentation today and for all the good work you do for Save Mount Diablo. And everyone, please enjoy. Thank you. So, as Ted just mentioned, uh, this talk is you know, it's titled Preserving the Past, Inspiring the Future, Acknowledging First Peoples in the Diablo Range. Um, where to start with this? You know, more than 10,000 years, people have been living in the Mount Diablo area. Um, it's a real inspiring place for us today. We look outside, we see this for miles and miles and miles. Um, and it's, it's one of these things that it, it is. It is a beacon of inspiration for people. It means home to most people as we're traveling and we're on the way back home. We see Mount Diablo jump out of the valley. 
Um, and that definitely is something that hasn't changed for people since the dawn of time, since people were living in the area, since Mount Diablos existed. And uh, I think it'll be that way as long as, you know, life exists on our planet. So um, with that, it's an important thing to think about, you know, what does it mean to preserve the past? And at what stake uh, is inspiring the future involved in that? Um, so let's jump into things a little bit further here. So as Ted mentioned, I was a park ranger for a number of years, the Eastern Regional Park District. Um, I was fortunate enough to work at Mount Diablo at Castle Rock Diablo Foothills for a number of years. Uh, I also worked at the trades department there. And um, I also worked alongside uh, various others along in the coast and shoreline division, um, working at a Point Pinole. And uh, all of these different places were incredible uh, ways to connect to the, the local Bay Area environment um, and definitely connecting mountains to the ocean to me is a very important thing. You know, the Mount Diablo drains to the bay, it drains into the Carquina Strait, it, it's all a connected thing. So whenever I was working at Point Pinole, I would find a way if I was out on a boat or out on the dock or, you know, whatever I was doing for the day, I would always try to center myself by uh, staring back at the mountain and remembering, you know, where the water came from and thinking about all the life that connected from that. So as the other picture shows, and as Ted mentioned, I'm an alpinist. Uh, a lot of things involved in that, I'll get into that in a moment. But, uh, you know, something that, you know, maybe it's a hidden talent. You see that little nut hatch sitting on my finger there. I'm a lover of critters, uh, definitely lover of critters, lover of birds. Um, they're an inspiration to me and uh, I love to do whatever I can to help preserve their life and, you know, look at them as equals and do everything I can for them to help preserve their life just as much as you know, it's important to me to preserve ours and, and to preserve the past. So that's a cool little moment I had with that little nut hatch when he came over and said hi to me. He actually landed on me twice. It was pretty exciting. Um, first time I really wanted to get my camera out, couldn't get it out fast enough. And I got it out and he came back. I was pretty excited about that. So little tidbit. So as I mentioned, I'm an alpinist. Uh, that includes me, you know, doing things in the big mountains. You know, I, I love uh, spending time in the mountains whether it's snow, as you can see here, this is uh, some photos of, you know, ourselves doing some snowboard ski mountaineering out of the desert. Uh, big mountains are, you know, an inspiration to me and they'll definitely always be an inspiration to me. Uh, a lot of ways that, that really moves my soul to be in big cold places, but it doesn't always need to be cold. Um, you know, I love spending time climbing rock and, you know, I, I've climbed rock all over the Americas, you know, from the high Sierra here to climbing ice in the Rockies here or climbing big peaks in the uh, Cascades, Northern Cascades. It's all a really powerful, inspiring thing, but it doesn't stop for me there. You know, I love spending time in Mexico, climbing big walls there, um, just seeing how I can apply my skills I've learned in this area to those places and uh, spending time in bigger places like the Andes is also a real inspiring place. Um, definitely a humbling place, a humbling environment, uh, an area that could really center you around what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. it really gets your mind thinking whenever you're climbing these big things for a long time. You have so much invested into it and uh, it's a powerful moment. So all these things included, obviously I'm not that good at aiming. As you can see in this photo, I couldn't quite capture that big thing in the background there. That's Mount Shasta. And this is another picture of me kind of putting the two together, if you will, climbing some rocks and uh, looking back at a very beautiful uh, life inducing, life inspiring mountain there on Mount Shasta. And that's actually looking at the uh, south aspect of it or what would be the John Muir route, um, bringing things back home to the Bay Area. So all very powerful stuff. But as I mentioned, uh, you know, I spent all this time traveling the Americas and climbing in big, big mountains, ice covered things, snow covered things, and that's all really big, but there's always something more important or more grounding to me. And that was definitely found here in Mount Diablo, specifically in the Pine Canyon area where I was a park ranger. Um, it was really easy for me to uh, fall in love with this place. It's a magical place filled with life, um, whether you're talking about plants and animals or people traveling through. And uh, I found that as a real inspiration for me to pursue a life of conservation. And, uh, you know, I, definitely through alpinism, through climbing, through skiing, through all these uh, big mountain endeavors, 
it really brought me back home and wanting to inspire other people to really understand what's going on in the world around them. There's, there's so much going on on Mount Avalon of itself. We could all spend lifetimes exploring that place and many of us have. Um, you know, I'll always be involved in, in climbing big peaks and traveling and having big goals like that. But my home is here in the Mount Avalon area and uh, Pine Canyon specifically, it's definitely my little dojo where I love to go and, and really uh, perfect my skills and stay connected to the natural world around me and inspire other people to do the same. So main reason why we're here today is we want to talk about uh, those that came before us, you know, and those who are still with us now. Uh, land acknowledgement of uh, peoples who have been here for 10,000 years or more, like the Ohlone, the Miwok, the Yukuts, uh, the Nisenan, a variety of other tribes and tribelets, uh, the Karkin, uh, the Wintu. So many different tribes have, you know, been here since, you know, their creation story or, or beforehand, and they're still with us today. And so I want to take a moment for us to kind of realize where we are in the world right now. We're here, I'm sitting in Walnut Creek. Some of you are sitting in Lafayette. That's Tat Can land uh, traditionally um, that we're both in. On the mountain up there, we're talking about uh, Bay Miwok uh, territories. And, uh, you know, these are all areas that we really should uh, be thankful and grateful for our ability to be alive in and uh, for the uh, good fortune we have. This little piece of obsidian I found on Mount Diablo. Just kind of a reminder to uh, to me what exactly is going on here. So preserving the past, you know, as as I began talking about, uh, these are important things for us to think about. What exactly came before us? What's at stake if we lose these things, um, inspiration wise and conservation wise to the future? And what does it mean to really start to dive into uh, what the past really was? So. At the dawn of time is where we're going to start this. And that was the uh, Chochenyo Ohlone name for Mount Diablo, Tuishtuk. And it still is today. Um, you know, very, very powerful thing if, when you compare that to Mount Diablo at the dawn of time. So let's think about that. You know, all creation came from this place. Um, and that's, that's a mind blowing thing. That's definitely uh, a different way to look at it than uh, Devil Mountain. You know, Devil Mountain is a, another aspect we'll get into. Um, we'll talk more about names of this place uh, in the future here, but at the dawn of time, I think it's a good place for us to start our, our conversation about Mount Diablo and the Diablo Range and native peoples here. And just the juxtaposition between um, tribal connections to, to the environment around them versus, uh, you know, what for all intensive purposes would be alien connections to these environments. So this is a map uh, from East Bay Regional Park District that really starts to uh, discuss some of the major tribes and tribelets um, that would basically encapsulate the East Bay. Um, you know, hopefully you see my mouse here. So what we're talking about, this zone right here, this is Mount Diablo. Um, this area here, the Chukon area here, this is Clayton Concord. Uh, a little bit north of this would be, you know, Concord Naval Weapons Station. So potentially there's a connection we could think about there for the future. Tatcan land, that's where we are now. Um, the Volvon really, really uh, were a tribe of the Bay Miwok. They really lived in and around the Mount Diablo area for long periods of time, since the beginning of time. Uh, we'll be discussing their connection uh, for long periods of time in a moment here. And the Soso and the Susuyan also were definitely major players in the area for you know tens of thousands of years. And we can continue south into where the Yukats live and further south into uh, the uh, Diablo Range. So a mountain with many names. As I mentioned before, there's so many different names uh, for the Mount Diablo area. I mentioned that, you know, the Chichenyo Ohlone word for at the dawn of time, but there's so many others. And, you know, the thing is, is that as I showed you in that map, there's such um, a variety of, of peoples living in the area, everyone speaking different languages, having different uh, tribal beliefs, different uh, creation stories, different different lives, you know, and uh, it's not that uh, unsimilar to what we experience now, but also very different in the sense of um, the connections between peoples were much different then. We didn't, they didn't have cell phones like we have now that we can get on NASA's website 
right right now. But at the same time, everyone could look outside and say, okay, the weather is going to be doing this. But they all had different ways of talking about that, different ways of interpreting that, um, and different different uh, interpretations of certain landmarks. So um, as you see here, there's a variety of different names for Mount Diablo. Tuishtok, as I'd mentioned, Ojampili is a northern Sierra Miwok name for the mountain. Duyambele is the Bay Miwok name. Super Manunu is the Central Sierra Miwok name. Um, and there's a connection between that and uh, a ma mountain mahogany, which was a kind of wood that was used potentially as a digging stick uh, by peoples for long periods of time to plant crops, to dig up crops, to do any number of a variety of things that would have to do with agriculture and then some. Um, Suki Homon is the Nisanan name. It means dog mountain. There's a great history behind that. Uh, there's legend is that essentially Mount Diablo is a place where people's dogs, you know, would come from. You know, we human beings have been living with dogs for long periods of time. Um, you know, human beings and dogs essentially are very similar to one another, you know, and so that's nothing that's different. That's nothing that's going to change anytime soon. Um, Cerro Alto de los Pavones. Now we're talking about Spanish names. So we're talking um, missionization and or uh, pre-missionization of these areas. That means the high point of the Volvon. So right away, we, we already see a connection between the Volvon peoples and the Mount Diablo region. Um, and just how much different, uh, you know, the, the connection is of, you know, how these things are described. We go a little bit further into Monte del Diablo or Thicket of the Devil. And this is a name that became eventually Mount Diablo and this is an interesting thing. So the Thicket of the Devil, actually, the story behind this is a group of Chufcon natives from the Clayton area were escaping, uh, essentially escaping a group of soldiers. And this particular area they were being imprisoned was um, in the Carquina Strait area, kind of near um, where the wastewater treatment plant is off Highway 4. And there's a confluence there of creeks going into the bay and uh, at a certain period of time, there is a wide amount of alders and uh, mahoganies and, and hardwood thickets that was just a maze to get through. And one night, this group of Chufcon captives basically escaped the prison and they lost uh, their Spanish uh, pursuers in, in no time at all because you know the, the reality of trying to get through this thicket was impossible. They ended up calling it Thicket of the Devil, and that name stuck. And here we are today with Mount Diablo. It's a bit different than, uh, you know, the Devil Mountain, you know, and Thicket of the Devil. But it's interesting how things stick, um, you know, when they're when they're used a certain way. It's kind of the, if you build it, they will come kind of concept there. So, you know, here we are. Let's get back to the mountain here, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Bay Miwok interpretation here. So. Um, and I'll actually read this to you guys. So looking over creation, this is a, a sign that uh, is actually near the summit of Mount Diablo State Park. Um, it's a really great interpretive sign. It uh, can be found at the uh, Devil's Elbow section of the drive up. And let me just read a little something about the creation story here as the State Park uh, has interpreted for us. So the creation story starts with Moloch, a California condor who lived on Doyambele, or as we call it today, Mount Diablo. Moloch would perch himself upon a prominent rock on the east side of the mountain to watch over the world. Some say the prominent rock is now known as Devil's Pulpit. Then one day, Moloch noticed that something was wrong with his rock, and he consulted his brothers. Moloch was told by his brothers that the rock was his wife. He was also told that his wife is about to give birth and that a big fire must be made. When the fire was hot, the brothers rolled the rock into it uh, when the rock was hot, and then it broke open. Thus, Wekwek was born. Wekwek it's the Falcon Man. After a time, Wekwek wanted to create people, but he didn't know how. So he asked his father, Moloch Condor, about it. And, uh, and was told he must speak to his grandfather, Olete Coyote Man, who lived at the ocean. Olete told Wekwek he knew how to make Muko or Mohawk Indian people. Uh, but first, Wekwek had to capture three birds, Chulo the vulture, Aweche the crow, Kokoi the raven, and once captured, he took the feathers from each bird. Next, Wek Wek, or the next morning, Wek Wek Olete went around the countryside and stuck three feathers into the ground at each place that he wanted to make Indian vi people villages. They also gave a place a name used by the Indians. The three feathers they stuck into the ground were Chaka the chief, 
Miyum, the woman chief, and Soloto, the poor people. Next morning, all the feathers sprang to life and became the Muko or Miwok people. So, you know, we see some connections there between various other tribes with the dawn of time and, and you know, with mornings starting there with uh, animals there. Um, the falcons, ravens, coyotes, condors, these are all animals that are very ingrained in Native Americans' uh, cultural belief system, religious belief system. Um, and uh, they're all real powerful Native, uh, Native uh, guides. And that's a common thing as you look through many different tribes. Um, but it's really interesting to, to see this here. Think about the animals that we see whenever we're out on the mountain. Um, respect them when we see them. And also imagine California condors being on the mountain. You know, that's an animal that has really started to, uh, you know, it's, it's rare and endangered animal. So here's a couple uh, photos of a peregrine falcon, weck weck. Uh, these are photos from Pine Canyon. Here's Olete, the coyote. Chulo, the vulture. Aweche, the little crows. Coco, the raven. And here we are at Devil's Pulpit. So next time you're in the Mount Diablo area and you're driving up to the summit, look out at Devil's, uh, you know, at Devil's Pulpit, see that prominent rock up there and think to yourself, wow, you know, this is the place potentially of a creation story of an entire, not only an entire tribe, but an entire way of life. So the condor would sit up on top of this rock and overwatch. Falcon came out of there and gave birth, essentially, and, and did what he could to bring human beings to the world. So these are really, really powerful things. You know, I mean, they're beautiful rocks to look at anyways. You know, you're standing up there. You can't quite see this in this photo, but in the distance there, you see the Sierras. You know, there's connections with many other tribes. There are connections with trade, connections with friends, family, supply, sustenance. You know, but... You know, just think about that. Next time you drive drive by there, you see that big rock, you imagine a condor sitting up there. And imagine a California condor mola just flying over, you know, the, the mountain range, you know, and looking down in, on what he can and, and creating life, doing what he can to uh, preserve life. And that's another reason what, to think about, you know, how important it is to preserve these things and to do what you can, you know, for endangered animals. Just imagine condors on Mount Diablo again. I'd love to see that. I was a ranger for a lot of years. I would love to see condors here. It, that would just be a mind blowing thing. So Morgan territory, home of the Volvon. Um, Volvon peoples essentially had a, they essentially lived from the uh, Black Hills of Mount Diablo, all through these beautiful mountains of Morgan territory, all down into the Los Vaqueros watershed along the uh, Western shoreline there. It's a huge expanse absolutely enormous expanse of, of uh, territory. Um, you know, it's, it's really, if, if, you think, if you think about it, I mean, all these little towns we live in right now, they're all pretty good size, right? This just really is exponentially larger than Concord, uh, you know, Blackhawk, Danville, you know, the, these major, major cities in the area. This expands from the Black Hills, which was essentially be the Rock City area, the Los Vaqueros Reservoir. This is a huge expanse of land. And peoples lived there for 10,000 years or more, you know, completely connected to everything around them, um, equaled with everything around them. Um, and, and essentially would work within the, uh, you know, nature's time. This is a, a, a sign from the state park again you know, there's a lot of talk about grinding holes as uh, being sites, you know, village sites, things like that. If you if you look around in Mount Diablo State Park and into Morgan Territory, Los Vaqueros, this, these particular areas, Round Valley, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, grinding holes and village sites. Um, I mean, we're, we're talking a huge quantity of people lived in this area for a long, long periods of time. You look at some of these grinding holes, some of them are two feet deep by a foot wide. I mean, these are things that were used for long periods of time, but they weren't just used for grinding acorns. Um, you know, that might have been a purpose that many of them were used for, uh, but a lot of them are very specialized as well. And they could have been, they were used for various other foods as well. And buckeyes were a famine food, uh, berries, small animals, pine nuts, 
um, a variety of different herbs, uh, various different botanicals, um, various different uh, cockamites or what would be called uh, um, bulbs that you would find with rhodia plants or soap fruit or a variety of other plants that were found around them that were uh, sustenance. And uh, a lot of these plants were, you know, cultivated essentially. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a moment here, but uh, think about living in a place for 10,000 years and how connected you would be to everything around you, not only as a food source, but as a, you know, as a tool or as a, a medicine, things, things to think about. Um, you know, this is just a, an idea of what some of these beautiful areas of Morgan territory look like. You have these amazing forests with pine trees and oaks and these gorgeous boulders. And, uh, you know, the, this is the great time of year to be out there. You have this really, really short lawn. Essentially, it's really easy to move around in these areas and connect to them. I mean, you, you see manzanitas and uh, madrone trees and basically any kind of tree you can imagine in this particular area exists in the Morgan Territory area. It's, it's a huge botanical preserve um, into the Round Valley area as well. It's, it's, really, um, it's, a, it's a really magical place to spend time. You know, and within that, uh, there are various different ponds and springs and uh, creeks and streams and, and that flow into what essentially becomes rivers and becomes the, our bay. And, you know, the same bay that I would be looking up at at Point Pinole, these waters come from one of the uh, many springs that are in the Mount Diablo area. And uh, within those springs, they're sources of life. And they're not only just life for plants and animals, for human beings to live for long periods of time. Uh, this is a photo of a friend of mine collecting sedge. Um, sedge is a, an incredible tool for natives uh, that was utilized for long, long, long periods of time for baskets, for various other tools, for decoys, for, um, you know, very, very, very many, uh, many things. And there's certain times a year you have to utilize um, cultivating these plants, but also, you know, taking these plants, gathering these plants. And it's a, it's a very powerful thing to uh, be working in nature's time that way and, um, you know, working with things within your environment as your, your need uh, for success in life. Now, as I mentioned, uh, plant cultivation was a huge thing and um, all these California native wildflowers here all have great uh, specific purposes and they were, you know, essentially, uh, you know, farmed isn't quite the right word, but things were done and taken into account to maintain their existence in the world. They weren't just totally taken out because plethoras were found. Certain things were taken certain ways, certain things were taken certain times, certain things were taken traditional ways um, and used traditionally. So um, within this photo here, we have a variety of plants. Um, on the right here, we have sacred datura, datura ridei. It's a, it's a uh, medicinal plant to say the least. There's any number of medicinal uh, qualities connected to this particular plant. Um, it's also a spiritual plant uh, used in ceremony and uh, its use was very wide in the Diablo range. This next plant here is Calicordus americosa lily. Uh, just an absolutely beautiful plant, beautiful little uh, little cockamite or beautiful little um, um, bulb there that's a really tasty thing. Soap root's another thing that has a delicious um, bulb to it and so are the Brodia plants um, and they're widely found on the mountain but at different times. This little damsel flies hanging out on, on another one of those little sedge roots that I showed uh, my friend harvesting and this plant on the right here is Salvia spathacea hummingbird sage. Um, it was actually used in uh, pipe smoke, tobacco smoke. It's another sacred plant um, that's cultivated and it's a real rare plant to find right now in Mount Diablo as a result of uh, climate change but um, nonetheless, it is one of these sages that will really blow you away. Its scent is just, it's one of the most beautiful flowers you'll ever see in your life. Beautiful flowers you'll ever smell. They're really large, about the size of a baseball, uh, where you look at these blossoms and uh, hummingbirds love to come and pollinate these things, hence the name hummingbird sage is a uh, common name. Um, other plants in the area that are, you know, I mean, I could go down the list for I can do a 45 minute talk just on ethnobotany here, but uh, I'll hold off on that for now. Um, this other plant here, the ethereal spear is another plant that comes back regularly that uh, was utilized on a regular basis. Um, 
in the bottom left there, you see a wiki up uh, that was built out of, again, sedges and cattails. And these are a traditional uh, house, essentially, for uh, Ohlone peoples and Bay Miwok peoples, potentially. Um, you know, this, that can be seen at the uh, Coyote Hills Interpretive Center in East Bay Regional Park District in Hayward. That's an amazing museum, and I recommend everyone go check it out if they get a chance. It's a beautiful place. Um, ceremony in typical years, not in COVID year, ceremonies done there, and it's, it's an amazing thing to go experience uh, the Ohlone days there. This uh, bouquet of sage is in front of us here is the black sage, a uh, very medicinal plant, and it's something you'll find all over the mountain. Um, my friends and I, we go climbing out there, we come home smelling like black sage, everything smells like black sage, it's in your hair, it's all over you, it's, it's, when I think of Mount Diablo, you know how, we, our memories are connected to our olfactory nerves, you know, you think about scents, but I think of Mount Diablo, I think of the smell of black sage, they're, they're basically the same thing. Um, in the background there is a good friend of mine, his name's Doc Hale, he's a Lafayette resident, uh, Jim Hale. He's an ethnobotanist in the area, biologist, um, and this particular photo is taken of him um, when he was doing some salmon surveys in one of the uh, watersheds up coming off Mount Diablo. So imagine for long, long, long periods of time, you know, salmon running up the mountain, um, steelhead running up the mountain, just, just a plethora, uh, a bounty of survival, you know, and the area itself was much different than we think of being in right now. You know, we have salmon, like I said, steelhead running up and down the mountain, bears, um, antelope, elk, you know, that's just to name a few things, but it was a much different environment than what we have now. You know, and the salmon is, is definitely a sacred animal to many, many, many tribes. Um, and that would be no different uh, for our, our local Bay Area tribes either. So one thing you'll definitely see in the uh, Morgan Territory era, area are these beautiful manzanitas. I mean, I've seen manzanitas there 50 to 60 feet tall, just huge in diameter, huge in circumference, old trees. This guy's basically what I'm getting at. Very, very old trees, trees that have adapted to fire, trees that have adapted to endure. And, and they were tools as well. And, uh, you know, the wood from a manzanita is a real, real hard wood. It's something that, you know, you see some of these photos here some of the burning on it or some of the dieback, you know, this tree is thriving for sure. And basically there's very few things that would come in the way between this tree living and existing um, now and how it did thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago in this case. Um, so just something to think about, you know, the beauty of, of uh, endurance. So here's uh, another quick photo of um, some just things to remember where you're at, what you see when you're in the area, you know, hiking through Morgan territory a couple days back, I looked down on the ground and these are all pieces of obsidian um, or, or um, chert or basalt that were um, essentially flit napped or made into tools that this is all debutage um, that's sitting on the trail and it takes a keen eye to kind of cue yourself into what you're looking at. But once you kind of take a step back and start looking down and thinking about what it is that you're seeing, how the patterns change, you could really readjust uh, what you're looking at and, and things come to life really quick. You start to understand where you were, how long people had been there for, the extent of trade. You know, this, obs this obsidian here, for example, probably came from Napa or the uh, Bodhi area. There's no obsidian in the Mount Diablo area. Um, the chert probably came from the upper sections of the mountain. Um, and the basalt probably came from the Napa area too, but nonetheless, we're, what we're talking about here is uh, connection of peoples, connection of, uh, um, you know, various different or civilizations, organizations, and ways to continue, uh, continue your way. And also these are, just like the manzanita, these are things that are, will endure. This is a view looking down from, uh, you know, the beautiful, overlook that Moloch the Condor hung out on. And this is looking out on Morgan Territory Road. And right down here in the corner, that's uh, Curry Canyon Ranch House. This is Curry Canyon in its entirety here. And uh, just kind of gives you the expanse of, you know, what the size of this tribelet was living through, you know, what, what it was, of where they were. This beautiful sun, sunsets can be seen there. Huge old oaks, this particular oak is probably uh, 350 years old. Um, and there's some 
pretty cool things involved with this too, just based on the structure of it uh, going back into cultivation. Um, as you can see, there's a, a pretty sharp 90 degree turn there. And um, that's a traditional way of kind of being a marker for people to come and join places and to follow kind of signs to places. Uh, so this is a tree that has definitely endured many, many years and connected to people for a long time. So now we'll jump into uh, talking about the Los Vaqueros area, the Vasco Hills. So Los Vaqueros, as you can see in this, uh, the huge body of water there, the Volvon tribe, all these lower hills that would be on the right side of this uh, particular area, that's all still Volvon land. Um, you can't, couldn't see Los Vaqueros from the picture I just showed you of the extent of Morgan territory. So this just kind of expands that uh, concept for you of just how massive this area is. Uh, and the hills there and the above the, the lake there, those are the Vasco Hills. And uh, that's an area that's kind of co-owned by the East Bay Regional Park District and the water, Contra Costa Water District as well. And there's, uh, it's an amazing place. So I definitely would recommend anybody and everybody who's watching this to look that up in East Bay Regional Park District site. Um, when they start doing tours, again, to sign up for those tours. They go quick, but it's, it's an amazing place to spend time in. It's a preserve you can only go to with a uh, naturalist through their program, and it's a magical place. Rushy Peak is just on the other side of the Vasco Hills, and that, again, is it's another very strong spiritual center for people, uh, the Sasoan people specifically. And uh, this is an area where, um, you know, as I mentioned, this is this is kind of the center for a lot of people. So there are some major trade routes that existed in this particular area. Uh, tribes would be visiting this particular area during uh, certain times of year for ceremony, but they also would be meeting there for trade of any number of, of items uh, all over the, definitely the state of California, but going further south, uh, going further east, and definitely further north as well. Um, you know, serious commerce for thousands and thousands of years existed here, and uh, it's a sacred place to the Ohlone peoples for sure. It's it's definitely a beautiful, magical place. It's a place that I would recommend everybody uh, do some research on. Um, again, this is something, it's East Bay Regional Park District land. And if you go to their website, you can see more about this. Um, it's also a Golden Eagle, a huge Golden Eagle Haven, actually. There's higher populations of Golden Eagles in that particular area than anywhere else on the planet Earth. And this particular one here kind of floored me one day. I was walking in there and uh, this, this Golden Eagle, and you can argue with me if you'd like, but this thing had an eight foot wingspan. It was just massive. At first I thought I saw a condor. And uh, I mean, as you can see, it's a very large bird. And so uh, I definitely recommend going there and spending some time. You know, as I mentioned, water is a source of life. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. There's everything you can imagine for sustaining life for long periods of time. Um, and it's, it's definitely uh, a very powerful place. So going further south of Altamont Pass, you know, we're going into now Yucca territory. And this is further south than into, into the Diablo Range. And this is a uh, particular photo is taken in the Del Puerto Canyon area. And this is where the area, the mountains here get really large, uh, really rugged, a variety of canyons. And it's, it's a, another one of these places that really, if you put this in any other state, this would be on their state seal, it'd be on their coin, it would be, you know, just the, the major landscape object for that particular state or country even. I mean, it's just a magical place in and of itself. Uh, I definitely recommend people go to Del Puerto Canyon and explore this particular area, but uh, Yucca peoples lived here for thousands and thousands of years as well. and. Um, these particular canyons being as steep and, and rugged as they are definitely provided uh, havens for peoples as the mission were coming in to the areas um, and also provided a haven for uh, horse thieves, you know, after the missionization of areas and the ranchero started going and these were hideaways for people um, kind of traveling, you know, into Mexico uh, from this particular area, you could really get lost in this particular area fast. There's really steep and deep canyons everywhere you look. And uh, it's an easy place to survive for long periods of time. Um, with the watershed that's here, there's a beautiful river that runs right down the center. Um, and it's actually a, um, a spring as well. It's called Adobe Springs, beautiful, delicious, um, magnesium rich water. And uh, it's a place where 
I definitely recommend everybody go and see and spend time in and connect to and hopefully see a condor in. It's kind of the in between between where condors are down in the Pinnacles area and the Diablo, Mount Diablo area proper. So um, huge wildlife corridor here, beautiful place. Just absolute stunning rock features, um, serious diversity in geologic features you'll see there. And, um, you know, the fire really had a hard impact on it that, that we had for the uh, SEU fire complex. Um, but uh, it's just, it's, it's an astounding place. And to spend time there for thousands of years, like the Yokuts did and connecting it to others, it's other tribes, it's uh, definitely a sacred place in and of itself as well. And it's definitely, it's another place to spend time with the Eagles too. So I definitely recommend it. You'll see some Eagles cruising around probably and, uh, you know, go to Adobe Springs, drink some d delicious water and sit back and think, you know, wow, I'm in this really special area. I could get here in 45 minutes or, or less. Um, what does that mean? You know, like there, there's, there's this beautiful stretch of, of, you know, land in the Diablo range that people's lived in for thousands and thousands of years. It's that's makes it special in and of itself. But then you think about all the sustenance involved in that, the beautiful fresh air that we get to breathe, the fresh water we get to drink. I mean, that's where else do you need to live? You know, that's something we all all share the need for, you know, something we're all equal to. So things to keep in mind. So inspiring the future uh, is the second half of this talk. And, uh, you know, the concept is, you know, being with what we just discussed briefly um, with these tribes and the sacredness of this land that we're, we're discussing here for so many tribalists for such a long period of time, you know, the whole concept of inspiring the future into conservation is a means of healing our land. Um, you know, we sit back and think about what it, what it means to uh, protect these places. Um, we sit back and we remember those that came before us, you know, it's really motivational and um, it's really an inspiring thing to sit back and think, you know, wow, I'm connecting with, with time itself. Now, what am I doing to give back? This is a question I would ask myself. You know, I, I'd be out, you know, climbing some beautiful peak and I'd be up at the top and there's a time I was just so floored about what it was I was doing. So single-minded, like this is just the coolest thing. It's the most powerful thing. You know, why do I deserve to do this? I remember having this thought on this particular peak I'm standing on. This is Matterhorn Peak. You know, what is it that I love so much? I feel I love so much about all these things I'm connected to, but what does that mean? You know, why do I deserve all this around me? Like, what does it mean to uh, to connect to, to the nature around me? What what can I do to give back to the thing that I love the most? You know, and it's, it's not just how I feel here. It's the places that I'm in, the emotions they bring, um, the things you're connected to, they're, they're second to none. They're, they're so unique. So uh, just questions I have in mind. Let's say Mount Diablo, you know, we preserve, we defend, we restore, restore land, we enjoy land. Um, that's our, our main purpose. That's why we exist. In 1971, you know, this is when our, our organization essentially was founded. Uh, the state park here, as you can see in green, was 6,788 acres. Um, you know, and through our advocacy and acquisition efforts, we've expanded to over 120,000 acres preserved, as you can see in this particular image here. And all over essentially the Contra Costa County um, area going south into to Brushy Peak, north into Concord Regional Hills. All of this particular area has been, you know, preserved and, or we've helped uh, other organizations preserve it. And, and that's a really big thing when you think about that's the first step um, to doing something that you love is you preserve it. You know, you do what you can to make sure it doesn't change. And so now, as I mentioned, uh, we're starting to focus our, our radar into looking at the Diablo range of 150 mile by 50 mile wide corridor north to south, starting essentially at Altamont Pass and ending in Kern County. So there's so much more to explore there, so many more lifetimes, but it's gonna take inspired people to be uh, on, that, on that front line, doing what they can. So, you know, with that preservation in mind, you know, what we do is we do what we can to defend these places. You know, we go, we do what we can to set up great land use planning. You know, what does it mean to once once you've acquired these places or you've advocated for their preservation? Now, what do you do next? You know, what, what goes involved with planning for that land? You know, you have to do what you can to 
hopefully set up a restoration projects. Education is another huge thing. You know, our organization does uh, lots of educational um, opportunities for, for the public. We have Discover Diablo series, which is a huge thing. It's a free series of hikes that we offer the public where they can come and spend time with us on our preserves or and other um, open spaces on the state park or regional park. Uh, we have activities like, you know, hiking or birding or rock climbing or riding a bike or, uh, um, you know, open air painting, things like that. All these amazing activities that, you know, we're trying to educate people to the importance of uh, preservation of these places. Uh, we also have a thing called the Conservation Collaboration Agreement, and that's when we work with uh, schools and help educate them to the importance of, of conservation and preservation through various different stewardship activities. As you can see, these two young gentlemen here uh, planting some, some uh, oak acorns for hopefully uh, planting some oak tree restoration projects in the future. Uh, we do other educational projects uh, within the Conservation and Collaboration Agreement, uh, um, like a solo where essentially individuals go out and they solo and they, they get to contemplate, you know, what, what is nature and what is my connection to it? You know, what, why am I here? and Why am I uh, as a human being? And my, what's my important connection to the surrounding area, you know, and uh, how important is uh, you know, stewardship work when you're thinking of, of learning about, uh, you know, all the nuances involved in open space preservation. You know, and, and that's especially important right now as we get slammed with the climate crisis that we're in, you know, it's time to take action. All over the mountain, we see areas where trees look like they've exploded, like this upper section here from Sudden Oak Death. We had the, you know, the third largest wildfire in California state history in the SCU fire complex, 400,000 acres burned. Um, we have infestation of, of uh, bark beetles or various other fungi like Sudden Oak Death there. You know, and our air quality is really having a hard time, you know, as you can see in the lower picture there. Um, I'm sure you all remember that iodine day where essentially the world was looking through a, a camera lens. You know, all these things are impacted in a major way. And that's what makes, you know, conservation of these areas and defending them even more important. You know, and once you've done those couple of things, you've, you've preserved land, you've um, defended, and now it's time to do some restoration. You know, and to get back on top of, you know, where some of these lands have gone in the last, who knows how many years since they were first acquired, you know, and part of that, that's such a, that's essentially a stewardship uh, philosophical concept, you know, and with that, you have wildlife releases, you have building habitat for wildlife and wildlife corridors, um, you know, restoring waterways, planting trees, taking care of, you um, you know, rare in, uh, rare native species, removing graffiti from places, you know, doing what you can, building trails, doing everything you can to help get the, the land healed. You know, and it takes a lot of effort when you're talking about rebuilding a trail that's fallen apart. You know, here's a great photo series of a trail that's sunk down and everything that goes into having a beautiful trail that we walk on that, uh, you know, sometimes you see when you're hiking some of these trails are closed or whatever and it takes quite a bit of effort to get some of these things back into an area that's uh considered restored it's a little more on wildlife corridors you know that's one of our major focuses um is preserving them and, and building them so what we've been doing is allying with various other organizations like lindsay wildlife and, and building uh wildlife corridors by releasing ground squirrels uh, which are a keystone species uh, we do what we can to preserve lands that have, uh, you know, Alameda whip snake um, or, or rare birds like uh, peregrine falcons. And we do things, you know, like help build habitat for kestrels, um, which are another bird that's threatened and on, on the downturn. So we do what we can to help um, build these populations up and keep these areas as wild as possible. You know, we collaborate, like I mentioned, with Lindsay Wildlife. Um, but also we collaborate with organizations like Barrier Climbers Coalition, the State Park System, East Bay Regional Park District. Um, just last spring, we did this great cleanup where uh, we removed a bunch of graffiti, a bunch of, a bunch of trash, and did some good uh, restoration work on some, some climbing areas. And that was a huge, uh, huge thing that needed to be done that easily can go to the wayside if it's just being looked at by, a, you know, by, by one organization. You know, it, it takes everyone working together. There's a 
great another photo of our work that we've done with Lindsay and uh, some friends and partners that we have and some sweet little birds, you know, little baby kestrels there and one getting ready to fledge out of the nest. Little friends like this uh, screech owl moving into the nest once they all left. I mean, this is all great, great stuff. Now, as I, as I mentioned, you know, restoring creeks and watersheds is another huge thing. You know, water is our source of life. You know, we can only go so far if our, uh, our air and our water is, isn't as uh, healthy as it can be. So we do everything we can to maintain um, these beautiful watersheds that we're so fortunate to have in the Mount Dalo area. You know, and lastly, you know, we get to enjoy these places. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? We have these beautiful environments all around us. We get to go for a hike on, we get to go climbing in, we get to ride our bikes, we get to walk our dog, we get to recreate. And that's what it's all about, you know, and that's, that's true. That's a real positive thing, but it's also something that uh, it comes with responsibility. You know, looking at the co current COVID situation, our areas are really getting loved to death, but that's not a bad thing because it's also a reminder to us to, uh, you know, grow as a person and, and to reconnect to the land. Like I, like I mentioned, I'd be on top of these mountains wondering what am I doing here and why? What is about this recreational activity that's so powerful? You know, and it's the love and connection of the world that we all eventually get to and we all will learn from and, and do what we can to help restore and preserve these areas, you know, and, and that's what's really important. You know, it's a cyclical process. Um, just enjoying these areas at the end of a restoration isn't the end all, you know, we have to keep repeating this process, doing what we can to ensure that our beautiful nature is, is uh, stewarded best by us human beings because, you know, we're the stewards of these areas. So a quick question, you know, is how can I get involved in uh, doing, you know, advocacy work or, uh, you know, conservation work? I get asked that all the time. I got asked that when I was a ranger. I get asked now. I get asked when I go climbing. You know, and there's any number of ways, you know, you can become a steward. Uh, you can volunteer. You can donate. You can plant native plants and, and set up a native garden in your, uh, your front yard, your backyard. Do what you can for pollinators. Do what you can for drought tolerant uh, plants. You know, these are all really powerful things. It's all connecting to the land. It's all doing something positive and giving back to who you love. And that's, you know, the land around us in our particular uh, stance, it's Mount Diablo. You know, and, and that's really what it's all about, you know, is connecting to a beautiful place, you know, being able to be so connected to it, you're communicating with it. You're understanding what it is, where you sit and in, in, in amongst everything around you. You know, you're making a communion to a beautiful place like Mount Diablo. Uh, or the Sierras or anywhere else, you know, and you're building a community around that, you know, and that's it essentially brings us back to the beginning of our talk. You know, peoples did that in this particular area and all over the Americas, you know, for tens of thousands of years, you know, they were connected to this area, they were communicating with it, they were communion to it, making a communion to it, and they built a community around that existence, you know, and so that's, that's the take home with this is, uh, we need to build a community around doing what we can to help preserve these beautiful places because, you know, they're they're definitely going to endure the test of time more than us, and it's our responsibility as the caretakers to do what we can for them. You know, there's this mantra that a friend of mine uses a lot: uh, "If you take care of nature, it'll take care of you." And I think that's really really true. You know, especially with some of the stewardship work that I've done over the years, uh, and some of the rock climbing, mountaineering things that I've done. I definitely feel that I do what I can to help connect to these places, and I feel that, you know, a part of me is safe because of that, because I'm doing what I can to help myself and, and the environment uh, heal one another and live symbiotically with each other. So if you take care of nature, it will take care of you. And uh, here's a really cool photo of an eagle, a red-tailed hawk, and a kestrel all flying on top of each other. It's a pretty rare event to see that. And I, I was fortunate enough to see that in Perry Canyon in the Morgan Territory area one day when I was out working on the land and it gives you a sense of scale right there. They were all side by side, pretty big versus pretty tiny, you know, kind of like we are as people. So here's a, you know, a quick little reference page. If anyone's interested in uh, reading further into this or some other organizations that are worth researching and connecting to, um, check this page out. It's, there's a lot of really great uh, information out there and ways to connect. And uh, most importantly, thank you for joining me today, you know, and get out and enjoy the hills. It's a beautiful place. We're so fortunate to be part of, and uh, thanks for your time.